This video was made possible thanks to the support from my patrons. Pledge today and you can be involved in what videos get made next and also get early access to them. Link in the description. There's been an awful lot of Doctor Who to look forward to during the show's 60th anniversary. Two new Doctors, the TV specials, Once and Future, Doomsday, sort of. However, since its announcement, special number two, Wild Blue Yonder, is the thing that's had me most intrigued. Obviously, the mystery plays a big factor here. We've seen loads of location filming for the Star Beast and the Giggle. We knew about the Meep and the Toymaker's presence for a long time. But slotted in the middle of those high-profile Earth-based stories, we've had this unknown quantity. Mostly filmed in studio, meaning we've only seen what the marketing department wanted us to see in trailers. Is this a multi-doc story? Are there surprise cameos kept secret indoors? Is this the episode where Susan makes her triumphant return to Doctor Who, along with Sean Pertwee playing the third Doctor, riding a giant Zarbi? All we knew in advance was this little robot, and that was it. What, is, it, is Matt Smith inside the robot suit? Fandom went mad trying to decode this one pre-broadcast. So there's the mystery, but we also have a fresh directing blood for the series. Tom Kingsley, indie film darling turned prestige TV director, working behind the camera on terrific comedies like the first two seasons of Stathlet's Flats. I beg your garden, beg the first two seasons of Ghosts, and Block 2 director of the intense medical drama, This Is Going To Hurt. This guy's an incredible get for Doctor Who, and unlike anything he's ever worked on before in terms of scale and subject matter. And of course, there's the dual meaning of the title. Yes, it's a military song from the United States Air Force in the 50s, but also a term to describe the great unknown, the vastness of the sky and space and the journey into the stars. So what was being hidden here? Well, technically, a multi-doctor story. Sort of. Let me back up. After Donna spilled coffee on the brand new TARDIS console, we get a brief excursion to Isaac Newton discovering the theory of Mavity in 1666. Isaac Newton is played by Nathaniel Curtis, who you may recognise as Ash in Russell T Davis's It's a Sin. What a fun cameo. Anyway, the TARDIS promptly lands on a spaceship at the edge of the universe before promptly departing, after the Doctor begins rebuilding it. The ship they've landed on is massive and empty, with a strange alien language on the walls and echoing over the speakers every few minutes. A lone, slow robot walks the corridor. There's a banging outside, and the only clue they have is an airlock door that opened three years ago and then closed. But the Doctor and Donna are not alone, as there's a duo species entity on the ship that can take their shape and has their memories. It's a fight for survival, as this ship's fate has been sealed, and the universe could hang in the balance if the TARDIS returns and picks up the wrong pairing. If the Star Beast was Russell T Davis doing Earthbound Fun Peril, like Partners in Crime or Rose, then Wild Blue Yonder is definitely him back in Midnight or Waters of Mars territory. If I could describe this story in a word, it's bonkers. If I could have another word, I would say deep bonkers. There's nothing safe about this story, other than it being led by some of Britain's best actors and one of its best young directors. It's a slow burn where the main threat of the story, the not things, don't even appear until nearly the 20 minute mark. There's something very old school about Wild Blue Yonder, like the first act almost feeling like an introductory episode of a classic serial, like the fourth Doctor, Sarah and Harry wandering around Nerva Beacon for the first part of Ark in Space, or the first Doctor, Sue Susan, Ian and Barbara just exploring the Dalek city and the irradiated forest in the Daleks. I actually think the latter comparison is more apt because there's no TARDIS and the Doctor's sonic screwdriver has disappeared with it, so it's much more manual. And even when things start escalating and getting bigger with more profound stakes, the story essentially boils down to the most tried and tested Doctor Who element running down a very large corridor, something that even the general public were making fun of in the 1980s. There's only one thing to do now, but I can't quite remember what it is. Run up and down lots of corridors! That was the one!
it's something that's so tied to Doctor Who's identity. I'm legit kind of amazed that Stephen Moffat didn't lampshade it when he was showrunner. But then I remember he already did that in 1999. These corridors all look the same! But anyway, where was I? Yeah, this story is a drip feed of information, with the first act being the Doctor and Donna slowly learning about their environment whilst being watched in the shadows. God, that continuity error bugs me. Hands in pocket here, out of pocket there. I'm so sorry for pointing that out. The episode is effectively a bunch of in-depth conversations with short but intense bursts of action, from the Doctor and Donna reflecting on their brief meeting with Isaac Newton, Couple of things here. Firstly, I think this line is mainly the Doctor asking himself if he's now the type of person who opens up more about his feelings as opposed to someone who represses. Whether it be his thoughts after the events of Flux or how he feels about others, we even saw this last week. Because I absolutely love her. Oh, hmm. Do I say things like that now? But secondly, yeah, the Doctor being canonically pansexual has been a thing since 2005. I'm sorry if I'm the one to break this to you now, nearly 20 years later. Come on, folks, how on earth did you watch this character for 60 years and think, oh yeah, they're definitely hetero? Come on. And their meeting with Jimbo, an old, rusty, slow-walking robot with no speech or communications program. Incidentally, yeah, you can definitely tell this is the same production designer as the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie. Have you got controllers listening? Hello? I'm the Doctor, this is Donna, we need help. The thing you ought to know, I'm feeling very depressed. Is that it? Obviously, these scenes are so superbly acted by David Tennant and Catherine Tate, getting their characters to open up emotionally to their doppelgangers, but even the subject matter shows a bit of an ethos change in Russell T. Davis, at least when compared to 2005. When the Doctor sends Rose and the TARDIS home in The Parting of the Ways, he asks her to just let the TARDIS die, gather dust, and be forgotten. Let it become a strange little thing standing on a street corner. The world will move on the box will be buried. But all these centuries later, the Doctor now ponders that, more literally, how the TARDIS will outlive civilizations. They'll try to destroy it, but at the end of eternity, the bright blue box will endure. In 2005, Russell and the BBC expected Doctor Who to be a one-and-done revival, that the show would make a return, but would eventually go back into the metaphorical wild blue yonder. But now, nearly 20 years later, with the show celebrating its 60th anniversary, a new studio taking the reins, more Doctors and potential spin-offs and projects on the way, Doctor Who may now be a forever artifact of TV, a constant that will outlive us all. When civilization collapses and we're living in the Mad Max future world, we'll be trading Pating and Vashta Narada Funko Pops for Guzzoline in the Australian wastelands, where Crispy Pro and Josh Snares will rule together with an iron fist and... Sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. But what might happen if Doctor Who lives on forever and forgets its identity? What happens if it continues but loses its heart, its originality, and becomes mean-spirited and cruel, like so much of modern entertainment? Well, this is my theory. This is what the not-things embody. Something that exists out of sight, without shape, similar to the Weeping Angels, but they copy and take the form of what's nearby. The not-things are cold. Our universe is boiling by comparison. It's a creature with no implied default form. It just copies what's around it. I reckon when the captain was alive, there was only one of them, because there was only one captain. If this was a 13th Doctor story, for example, there'd be more of them to copy each member of the fam. God, evil Dan could have been canonized. If you existed here, no shape, no form, no purpose, then what's made you so bad? What's the point of being alive is not to make others die. Though to be fair, the Donna duplicate asks the Doctor duplicate for clarification on how many knees humanoids have, and she counts the salt while the Doctor duplicate exposits their vague origin, so this theory is not ironclad. But for something that struggles to wrap its head around the idea of shape and even something existing when it's out of sight, there's a lot of wiggle room here. But as a result, it's copied and internalized the cruelty and the war that has traveled across the galaxy. That's what it's duplicated. As the Donna duplicate so succinctly puts it, 
Love letters don't travel very far. We may even be dealing with an allegory for AI here. AI learning can't learn without a base code or source material. It needs information to work with. When you ask for AI to generate art, it essentially steals and copies other artists to try and create something within those parameters. The not things are trying to do the same thing here, not just stealing the likenesses of the Doctor and Donna, but their memories, literally scaring them to push them further to give them more to copy and take. Something the not things would not be able to do if the Doctor and Donna weren't there to feed at the material. I don't think it's a coincidence that AI artwork's biggest giveaway is its difficulty with human hands. And how do we first notice that something is wrong with the not things? My arm's too long. Look. I don't know why, but the arms are so very difficult. Also, notice how the not things never figure anything out in the episode on their own. Donna asks the good questions and the doctor comes up with most of the answers, but because the not things are telepathic, they are figuring it out at the same time. There's even a potential callback to the copying of language and speech from Midnight. Note who speaks first in these clips. So, what do you think? Do we, Do we have, have a, deal? a deal? The words move the walls, so the ship is slowly reconfiguring to become a very slow bomb. What? And if you want to take the comparisons to prior abstract experimental Russell T. Davis works even further, we have the Waters of Mars, where the captain of a space station in the future decides to take her own life in order to stop an evil cosmic being with face-changing abilities played by David Tennant. And in the next story, the Doctor regenerates. What is time? I think the episode works as well as it does because David Tennant is one of the best actors to play the Doctor when it comes to exposition. There's so many lines to learn as this character, so to make almost every one of them feel fresh and feel genuine is a legitimate feat in and of itself. But with so much of Wild Blue Yonder's story taking place years before the Doctor and Donna even set foot on the ship, Naturally, a lot needs to be explained. Catherine Tate is, of course, great at this as well, with Donna asking exactly the right questions, but I think this is the David Tennant power hour. As the duplicate Doctor so rightly puts it, how can the Doctor not think on a ship full of questions? These huge, compounding questions that literally shape the environment around them. Radical. What is that? This will all end in tears, I just know it. The robot, the airlock, the words over the speakers, the empty chair, etc. It's all wonderfully building to a tour de force of exposition and delivery near the end. I adore the Doctor, trying so hard to not talk or think at the end. And she took her own life so they could work out what she'd done. But you're working it out now. No, not me. Yes, you are. And so am I. It's all about slow. We don't understand the slow, so the captain set out to slowly stop us. So the ship is slow, the robot is slow, the words are slow, is that it? No. Catherine Tate gets a lot of great character work here, however. My favourite being her egging on her duplicate to cross the salt line. She probably has as much doubt as the Doctor as to whether or not they'll believe it, but she has the utmost faith and trust in him and does not let on for a moment. Cross the line! She doesn't believe it, but you said I'm stupid. And also brilliant. Then which one is it, Donna? Cross the line. Yep, this is the Dr. Donna, all right. But they really are the Dr. Donna in more ways than you might think. It's been 15 years since that pairing, and the Doctor is no longer the last of the Time Lords. He's no longer running away from the Time War and his involvement in it. However, Russell T. Davis, in this story, has replaced that grief and trauma with something new. I saw it. In your head. The flux. Now, I think there were some terrific ideas with the Flux. In concept, I like the idea of reshaping the central mystery of Doctor Who, and that the Doctor's life could have been shaped by her adoptive mother, who saw their life and even the universe itself as a giant experiment that they can manipulate and control. It's no coincidence that Tek Taeun, in Survivors of the Flux, is introduced tending to a massive tree in her spaceship. In Flux, the Doctor was revealed to be a rogue agent in the universe, acting like a reverse virus 
dangerous by accident, and the flux was engineered by the Division and Tech Taeyun to reset everything. Now, these are pretty cool ideas, but the character work is non-existent. In Survivors of the Flux, Tech Taeyun just walks away mid-conversation so the episode can stop exploring the character work and the emotions, and then Tech Taeyun is killed and the actual end state of the universe at the end of The Vanquishers is just left ambiguous, especially with the next few specials just carrying on with business as usual. But now, Russell T Davis seems to be trying to claw back some of the emotions of that story that were left on the table. Yeah, the the 13th Doctor has been running around business as usual, but with the 14th Doctor, we learn that they've been burying an awful lot of shit. It destroyed half the universe because of me. We stand here now on the edge of creation, a creation which I devastated. So yes, I keep running, of course I do. How am I supposed to look back on that? It wasn't your fault. I know! The Flux and his association with that and his possible new origin has given him a massive burden to carry. He knows that it wasn't his fault, but he was still at the center of this. And for a brief moment, it looks like Donna, his best friend, understands him. You can see David Tennant literally shaking with the discomfort of the conversation, but he's willing to have it. Just like the Doctor is willing to admit that he loves Donna or finds Isaac Newton hot, he's okay with having these conversations. In the past, he could control when he let his friends know about the Time War. He tells Rose in that London street. He lies to Martha about Gallifrey before regretting it and then coming clean at the end of Gridlock. But here, that trauma is instead wrenched out of him by Donna. And just as it seems like he's going to give Donna a big hug, the duplicate collapses into the floor. It was all an act. The duplicate talked to him to break him down. And it did. But not only that, it mocks him for it. I just couldn't keep it together. You are so amazing. We stare at that universe so far away. You have owned it. You are such a prize. What are you? The Doctor now seemed to be at a place where they could open themselves up emotionally, something that, as the 13th Doctor, they were afraid to do. And then it immediately backfires. With that context, this violent reaction makes a lot of sense. I think that Jodie Whittaker genuinely is one of the best actors working in TV today, and I would have killed to see her Doctor wrestle with such openly emotional material. David Tennant is so good in these scenes. He brings such intense mavitas to this episode, and I'd definitely rank it as one of his best performances in the show. You could argue that the Doctor not talking to Donna at the end is technically a regression of the character, echoing the I'm always alright endings of series 4, but in this case, I don't blame the Doctor. A few minutes ago, someone with his best friend's face melted into the ground and mocked him for his emotional openness. This is a deliberate strategy from the Not Things to scare the Doctor and Donna to make it easier to copy them, which is why the Doctor duplicate contorted its body and made fun of Donna. These insults cut harder when they're said by people you love and respect. Also, the Not Things shifting and contorting their bodies were a bit hit and miss to me. Not so much the execution, like I actually like the strange, shapeless, off-model Doctor and Donna chasing the hovercart down the corridor, once again similarities to AI-generated art, but I think when it's stuff like them only growing half a foot taller, maybe they could have pushed that further. Also, I didn't like the changing of their teeth. Not only did it just not look very scary, but I think they should have taken that visual, that idea, and bumped it up by a thousand. Don't just give them smaller jagged teeth in the mouths of the Doctor and Donna, but, I don't know, massively extend them and get creative with it. Do something similar to Moonfish in My Hero Academia, who has knives for teeth that he can extend and even walk on. Go all out with that imagery. Also, while most of this episode looks great, you can see the limitations of the tech and the budget when the Doctor and Donna are running down the corridor at the end. It looks a bit sloppy. It reminds me of The Flash. 
you can see the horror inspirations for something like The Exorcist or even Stephen King's It, specifically Bill Skargard's depiction of Pennywise the Clown. The latter was actually an interpretation that I stole from Lorgasm, but with permission, when he asked me to watch some of his review on a live stream. So it's okay. Don't come after me, H-Bomber guy. <laughs> Delete your channel. But now we get to some of the fan disappointment of there being no cameos. Now, technically, Wild Blue Yonder is a multi-doctor story, but it's basically a bottle episode, except in this case, it's a massive, massive bottle. But I, for one, am glad that we didn't get an episode full of Easter eggs and cameos, as easy and as cool as it would have been for the Doctor and Donna to encounter a previous face or companion, and the not things could have said, oh, you have so many faces and friends, it's hard to keep track of them all. And have David Tennant in a yelling match with Dark Capaldi, or Shadow Mandip Gill, or Heaton Park Eccleston, I think that would have pulled audiences too far out of the episode. Wild Blue Yonder is doing everything in its power to trip up the audience and keep them off kilter, from the Dutch angle camera work to the lack of human language in the setting, and so much more. So introducing a familiar face from the past might actually ground the audience and detract from the overall atmosphere. It's hard to scare or confuse people if you also include comforting fan service. I think that Russell showed remarkable restraint here, creating a bottle episode relying on two incredible actors, which culminates in a cute robot pressing a button at the other end of the world's largest corridor. Yeah, it could have been a multi-doctor story or filled with cameos and references, but Wild Blue Yonder took the braver and more interesting stance of just being the most Doctor Who story it could have been during this diamond anniversary. This episode is standing up on a pedestal and saying, Doctor Who, it's here. It's queer, get used to it. Now, while the episode may draw comparisons in the macro sense to episodes like Midnight or in the micro sense to The Satan Pit and Utopia, I will say that it's just as big and as bold and as good but it's not as polished as those examples. There are a few nitpicks that I have, like the constant translating of the countdown towards the end. Why didn't the not things destroy the robot in the past three years? I'd argue that maybe they couldn't because there was nothing organic for them to copy and form a shape until the Doctor and Donna turned up, so I'll let it pass, but I've watched this episode about six times by now, and this is the question that I always ask myself towards the end. If the not things are locking into shape by their final dialogue exchange... Ten minutes ago, they'd have ripped that door off its hinges. Now they're just standing there, locking into shape then it feels like a cheat to have the Doctor Duplicate change its shape to outrun everyone at the end. Also, why is the TARDIS playing Wild Blue Yonder? The episode really doesn't need it, but I am willing to read your 6,000 word video essays on why it's brilliant. That sounded sarcastic, but I genuinely am. I also think that the Doctor needing to use the TARDIS computer to figure out Donna's arm length at the end feels a little bit like a cheat. Now, all of these nitpicks, I'm sure you folks can give your explanations in the comment section below, and they're valid, and I'll read them, and that's fine. These are nitpicks, these are not hills that I'm willing to die on. Because to be honest, when we get to that climax and the Doctor takes the wrong Donna away and Catherine Tate is in that huge green screen studio in Cardiff looking off camera into the corridor of the self-destructing spaceship, the sheer horror in her eyes as the explosions cascade down the hall and her believing that this is how she's about to end, all of my complaints just fade away. The third act of Wild Blue Yonder ranks up there with some of the absolute best TV I've watched this year, hands down. And it all came down to a very slow robot pressing a big red button. I could calculate your chances of survival, but you won't like it.
On the one hand, you could argue that Wild Blue Yonder is the budget saving special so that Bad Wolf could afford to make the Meep a practical costume in the Star Beast, or affording Neil Patrick Harris in the Giggle, as well as all the location filming, and that might be true, but it certainly doesn't feel like it. Tom Kingsley's direction here is sublime, with incredible use of fake cuts and body doubles. There were some great looking spaceships during the Chibnall era, and I'm glad that the trend is carrying on, as the Doctor and Donna move from room to room, but each has their own vibe and lighting setup. I love this single take, going from the cockpit to the base plate repetition filaments room. And why did I say that like I understood what a base plate repetition filament is? While Murray Gold composing the Star Beast was him doing business as usual, with Wild Blue Yonder, I get the sense that he was going way out of his comfort zone. Yes, there's the bombast, especially towards the end, and it's so effective then, but during the first two acts, it almost seems to take inspiration from Segan Akinola's ambient approach during the last era of the show. We even get some flux motifs during the scene where it's mentioned. It's such a good score, and I can't wait to listen to it properly when it gets an official release. And in the end, the Doctor ejects the fake Donna out of the TARDIS, brings the real one inside, and they escape the exploding ship. And they can't even talk to each other, so overwhelmed by the past hour, and they just hold each other on the floor of the newly repaired TARDIS. I told you this would all end in tears. Later, the Doctor does not want to open up emotionally about what he talked about earlier. Even Donna seems pretty unwilling to open the can of worms of the Doctor, appearing to abandon her to an evil space duplicate, and the Doctor even expresses regret at invoking the salt superstition at the edge of the universe. I invoked a superstition at the edge of the universe, where the walls are thin and all things are possible. I just got this feeling. Oh. Feeling of something. I hope this is acknowledged later, because it feels a little bit tacked on in this ending. Like Jesus Russell throwing in another 5,000 words of analysis in the penultimate scene. Take a day off, man. But the past hour just fades away, and is recontextualized with the arrival of Wilf, who is waiting for the TARDIS in his wheelchair, and he's speechless and filled with emotion after seeing the Doctor's face again. The same face that gave his life for him. The same face who he risked everything to save and from stepping over that invisible moral line in the end of time. The same face that Wilfred promised he'd think of when he looked up at the stars every night on his granddaughter's behalf. There are no words, just love. The 10th Doctor and the 14th Doctor have the same face, but unlike the not things that copied him, he actually is the genuine article because he can love. The not things may have been right in that love letters don't travel as far as hate and war, but here we have the soldier who never killed anyone, when the doctor needed to see a familiar face that could bring him joy once again. In what is now confirmed to be Bernard Cribbins' last scene in Doctor Who, before his passing last summer at the age of 93. A perfect way to end this story before it's revealed that the world has gone to madness and only the Doctor can save them. Wild Blue Yonder is a lot. It's truly dense television, and I get the sense that much smarter people than me are going to have incredible and insightful takes into this 54-minute episode. Genuinely, I think decades from now, whole books are going to be written about this episode, and for good reason. It seems to have an awful lot on its mind from the show's legacy and unknown future. The personal violation of having your likeness stolen and how it can be weaponized against you, akin to AI, and even the contradiction of human nature when you can believe the theory of gravity and mavity at the same time. It looks great, it sounds great, David Tennant and Catherine Tate give wonderful, vulnerable performances, culminating in a bittersweet coda. Obviously, not every story can be like Wild Blue Yonder, otherwise they would not be as special when they do come along, but if we're seeing more of this Russell T Davis over the next few years, Doctor Who's journey over the next frightening, unknowable horizons will be worth it. 
So join me next time as we bid farewell to the 14th Doctor and Donna as this trio of anniversary specials culminates with one last trip to Earth which is being influenced by a cosmic being that the Doctor is all too familiar with. In The Giggle. I'll see you then. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching my review of Wild Blue Yonder. I'm sorry if my voice was not really up to the task this week. Currently recovering from a pretty heavy cold. But for those of you who powered through and stuck around to the very end, I really appreciate it. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already. That's the best way to keep up to date with all of my Doctor Who videos. And you can also leave any comments down below to appease the almighty YouTube algorithm. Great way to support my channel as well is by supporting me on Patreon. You get these reviews early, you get your name in the credits as well, and you can also get access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server. And I'd like to take a moment to thank these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Ben Langdon, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver Bausiger, Dean Jones, Dylan Whitaker, Air Hoovian, Ginger Animator, Jay Black, Jack D. Evans, Joseph Adams, Lard Dragon Ezra, Leela, Maria Bergman, Marianne Mogensen, Mario Fanboy 15, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nick M, Palex, Pat Andrews, Randall Sprinkle, Raven Woods, Renegade Time Lord 97, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Ryan Duncan, Sam Montgomery, Samuel Whitaker, Sarah Parker Shemilt, The Evil Dalek, The Brit Sniper, The Raggedy Jedi, The Scarlet Watcher, Toby Loxton, Will, and Yevnu. Thanks so much to all of my patrons, thanks to you for watching, and I'll see you next time.